Now we're going to look at macroeconomic models. And macroeconomic models, um, in the context that I'm going to discuss them, are like production possibility frontiers, consumption possibility frontiers. Uh, then I'm going to apply the production possibility frontier to illustrate the benefits of free trade. A production possibility frontier is a depiction of all different combinations of two goods that a society or an economy can produce with a fixed amount of resources and the best available technology. So this is a, a model that occurs or is applicable in the short run. The PPF models scarcity and choice. The PPF models opportunity cost. Opportunity cost of using a resource in a particular way is the value of the resource in its best alternative use. Assumptions. Only produce, the economy only produces two goods. The actors in the economy use the best available technology. And they use all available resources. The PPF puts three features of production, uh, production possibilities into sharp focus. Attainable and unattainable combinations. Efficient and inefficient production. There's also a thing called allocative efficiency. And trade-offs and free lunches. Okay, so here we have uh, our, uh, let's take the President's health care proposal, for example. Okay, so the production possibility frontier is modeling the decision of our society or our economy to produce all the goods but health care on the x-axis and health care. Okay, so the first question is, is point A efficient? Also, is point A attainable? Well, point A is not efficient because it lies inside the PPF, which is kind of like where we are circa 2009-2010. Unemployment is high. So when a production possibility frontier is modeling the economy of a society and unemployment is high, you're at a point like A. When the economy has um, got very, very low unemployment, very, very low unemployment, you're kind of outside the production possibility frontier. Unemployment would be considered too low. Inside, the unemployment is too high. When the economy is on the production possibility frontier, we would say that real GDP is equal to what it should be, its potential. And when, we're, when the economy is on the production possibility frontier, or very, very near it, then unemployment is just right, usually about 5 or 6%. But in this scenario, unemployment is way too high. Um, but it is attainable. The A is attainable, right? We can produce 74 units of health care and 20 units of all of the goods, right, uh, with 10% unemployment, for example. So point A is attainable. Now, what is the opportunity cost of moving from point A to point B? Well, politicians always argue that if we can cut waste, if we can become, make the government more efficient, uh, we can just offer more health care. But I've been hearing that. I've been listening to politicians uh, say that since 1980 when I was in sixth grade. Every state of the union, every president talks about cutting waste, fraud, and abuse. And it never really happens. Okay, So if we're at point A and we're able to eliminate all that waste, fraud, and abuse, government, in this scenario, can give us a free lunch because from A to B, we're getting, you know, we're going from 74 units of health care to 98 units of health care. We're getting 24 units of, of it without giving up any other goods because resources at A are not being fully utilized. Okay, so... At point A, we get, we're, we're producing 20 units of all of the goods. At point B, we're producing 20 units of all the goods. So we're essentially getting a free lunch here. Now, unfortunately, the economy is usually on the production possibility frontier. Okay, or near it. So the opportunity cost from, from, uh, of moving from point D to C, which is more realistic, um, if we want 60 more units of health care, going from D to C, then we have to give up eight units of all of the goods. So there's a trade-off. Okay? And what do I mean by giving up? How do we give up other goods if 
we get 12 more or 16 more units of health care. Well, if the government's doing this, if the government is taking or giving us more health care, well, it's got to pay for it somehow. And it either pays for it with higher taxes on the current generation of workers, or it taxes future generations of workers. And what do I mean by taxing future generations of workers? Well, the current set of workers don't want to pay higher taxes, which is usually the case, then the government runs a budget deficit. And it finances that budget deficit by selling bonds that future workers have to pay in the future. Okay, So healthcare is not a free lunch because when we're on the production possibility frontier, because its operating cost is 0.5 units of all the goods. Now, how did it get the 0.5 units of all the goods? Remember, the rise is 16, 16 more units of healthcare. The run is 8. And the thing here is we want one more unit of all of the goods. So if we take six, if we take 8, the change in all of the goods, divided by 16, the change in health care, the, ch the change in all the goods is 0 0.5, right? 8 divided by 16 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 divided by 1 is 0 0.5. So we have to give up 0.5 units of all the goods in order to get one more unit of health care. Okay, what is the opportunity cost of moving from C to B? Maybe 20 or maybe 90 units of health care isn't enough. Politicians want to give us 98 units of health care, right? We want to go from 90% coverage to 98% coverage in terms of health insurance. Okay, so if we want eight more units of health care, we have to give up eight units of all of the goods. So if the economy is on the production possibility frontier and we want eight more units of health care, we have to give it eight units of all the goods according to the production possibility frontier. Now, eight divided by eight is one, right? And one divided by one is one. So if we want one more unit of health care, we have to be willing to give up one more unit of all their goods. Why does the opportunity cost of health care increase as we move up the production possibility frontier. Remember, from D to C, to get one more unit of health care, on average, we had to give up a half a unit of all of the goods. From C to B, to get one more health care unit, we had to give up one unit of all the goods. So the opportunity cost of providing health care is increasing as we move up the production possibility frontier. Now, why is this? Well, it's because as an economy increasingly specializes in health care, the opportunity cost of producing healthcare increases because we are using more and more resources that are poorly suited to produce healthcare. What does that mean in English, right? In non uh, jingoistic terms. Well, think about this. At D, maybe D was allocatively efficient, right? You know, you don't want all bananas. I mean, for example, if this were bananas and fish, right? You wouldn't want to be over here because, you know, eating bananas every day is kind of lame, right? Or you wouldn't want to be down here because eating fish every day, kind of, you get kind of sick of it, right? So you want a kind of a mix. So you can think of D as a point that's allocative efficient, right? Remember the golden rule, balance in all things? So D, you have, you have some not, you have some, you know, you have some low profile tires, you have a flat panel TV, you got your DVDs, you also got some health care too, right? It's not just all health care, it's not just all other goods. So maybe D is allocatively efficient. So at point D, maybe the, the resources that are ideally suited to produce televisions, to produce software, uh, to produce healthcare, are being used to, in those industries. But as you move up the production possibility frontier to the left, up and to the left, you're taking a resource that is ideally suited to do tax returns, like my brother Todd. He's ideally suited to do tax returns. I'm not. And you tell him he has to be a nurse. You're taking me, who's ideally suited to teach economics and do economic research. You're telling him or me that I have to be a nurse or a doctor, and I'd be the worst doctor there is, right? You're also taking pizza ovens that are <coughs> ideally suited to make pizza, and you're going to try to adapt them <coughs> excuse me, to some kind of technology in nursing or cutting out somebody's appendix. A pizza oven is a pizza oven. You can't really adapt it. For some medical technology okay so that's why it's bowed out and now 
the more bowed out or the more different the two goods are if this were say um, pizza and this were say if this was uh, say uh, televisions well the resources that are needed to produce those two goods are vastly different so the more different the two goods are in a production possibility frontier graph the more bowed out the more bowed out the production possibility frontiers now if this were say cars and this were say tanks then production possibility frontier would be more of a line because the resources that are needed to make cars is very similar to the resources that are needed to make tanks okay so the more dissimilar the two goods the more bowed out the production possibility frontier is because the opportunity costs rise more quickly now this point be efficient is point be attainable production efficiency is a situation in which we cannot produce more of one good or service without producing less of something else so point B by definition is efficient we'd have to give up other goods to get more of another good at point B points B C D represent efficient production levels they're both attainable and efficient okay now is point E attainable how can we get to point E well, E is not attainable currently because this economy does not have the resources to produce a point E. Point E is attainable when new resources and technologies are found. That's why countries used to go to war and expand their boundaries. At one point, the sun never set on the UK. Why is that? Because the UK is a small island with limited resources, and they colonized much of the world. Suppose we are at point D. What happens if we invent a new medical technique? Well, Nothing's really going to happen if all the resources being used to produce other goods and services. Nothing's really going to happen to this quantity, right? Because it doesn't make this um, the production of these goods and services easier or less costly. However, inventing the new technology will do what? It'll make producing healthcare more less costly, more productive, right? So the production possibility frontier shifts up along the healthcare axis, but doesn't shift at all along the non-healthcare axis. So we can get more healthcare by moving to point F as a result of this new medical technique, right? Or maybe we thought 74 units of healthcare was fine. We could be at point G, right? So the new technique can either allow us to have more health care or more other goods or something in between. Okay. Now suppose we're at point F. What happens if we discover 1.2 trillion barrels of natural gas off our coast? Well, that's going to shift the production possibility frontier outward along both axes. Point E is now attainable, efficient production level, an attainable efficient production level. Okay, now let's look at a related concept, the consumption possibility frontier. This is also known as a budget line. Okay, so consumption possibility frontier is a depiction of all different combinations of goods and services that a society can afford with fixed set prices. A consumption possibility frontier is simply the budget line for the entire economy. All the combinations of two goods that can be consumed from a given fixed budget when the prices are known. Suppose the government budgets $24,000 per citizen for health care and military production. Assume the price of military services is $120 per citizen while the price of health care is $100 per citizen. Okay, So the way a consumption of possibility frontier works or your budget line works is we take the price of the service times the quantity that the government's going to provide us with plus the price of health care times the quantity that the, the government's going to provide us with. That has to equal the budget, so we think. This expression is total money spent, total tax revenues spent on military protection. This represents total spending spent on health care. The sum of the two represents total government spending. And it 
supposedly has to equal the budget. Okay, since prices are known, we plug in the prices. Since the budget is known per citizen, we plug in the budget. And we get an equation. We have two unknowns in this equation. We can graph this equation. Okay, to graph it, let's plug in zero in for military. Now, very liberal Democrats would love this allocation, wouldn't they? Right? Zero military units. Zero military uh, protective services. Very liberal Democrats, I think, would like this policy, right? So if they're successful, how many units of health care could they give the American people? Yes. Or give them in terms of services? Well, since this is zero, we're left with, on the left-hand side, 100 times the quantity of health care. Well, to find out how many units of health care the government can provide us with, we divide both sides by 100. So if liberal Democrats are very successful at getting spending on military down to zero, they can provide us each with 240 units of health care. Right? So we plot that point down here. So you can think of this as a very liberal Democrat proposal. What about a Republican proposal, a very right-wing conservative proposal? Well, maybe a right-wing conservative wants to give people zero units of health care, spend zero amount of money on health care services. Then they can spend, what, how many units of, they can spend all the government's budget, they can spend all the government's budget on military, right? This is total spending on military protective services. Divided both sides by the price of military gives us 200 units of military protective services. Okay, so you can think of this as a very conservative position, and this is a very liberal position politically. Connecting the dots gives us the budget line of the government. Okay, so here the entire budget is spent on health care. Here the entire budget of $24,000 is spent on a mixture of health care, mostly health care, less military. Here, the entire budget of $24,000 is spent on military and no health care. Okay, now plot a point that indicates the government is running a budget deficit. Okay, so if the Congress comes up with a compromise of 180 units of health care and 150 units of military, well, that according to this graph, is going to cost more than the $24,000 per American citizen the government has budgeted or collected in tax revenue. How do I know that? Well, let's plug in 150 and 180. We'll plug 150 into the quantity of military, and since it's priced 120, we multiply 120 times 150. Since the price of health care is $100, we plug in 180, right? And the government is spending... $18,000 per American citizen on military and spending $18,000 per American citizen on health care, which means the government is spending $36,000 per American citizen on both these services, which exceeds the budget of $24,000. So this is tax revenue minus government spending per American citizen. The government's running a $12,000 per American citizen budget deficit. So the point out here is a deficit. This represents deficit spending. Now plot a point that indicates the government is running a surplus. Okay, so suppose instead politicians agree to offer American citizens 50 units of health care, or 60 units of health care each, and 50 units of military production each. How do I know this represents a budget surplus? Well, let's calculate the cost of doing so. 120 is the price of military. We're only getting 50 units of military protective services. 100 is the price of health care, and they're only giving us 60 units of health care. So we're spending $6,000 per American citizen on military protection services. We're also spending $6,000 on health benefits of American citizens. So a total of $12,000. So the government is only spending $12,000 on our behalf for military and health care services. The government is collecting $24,000 per American citizen 
from tax revenues. It's only spending 12000 So per American citizen, the government is running a $12,000 surplus a year. Back in 2006, the Republicans held both houses of Congress. And maybe they were given us allocation A, 150, 150 units of military protection per American citizen and only 60 units of health care per American citizen. The Democrats came in and took over in 2007, and maybe they wanted to pass point B, 180 units of health care. In order to do that, if they wish to keep or balance the budget, they know or knew that at the reduce military services from say 150 to 50 in order to keep or to balance the budget for that given year right so is there a cost of moving from point a a republican proposal to point b a more of a democrat proposal well there is if government desires a balanced budget so from point a to point b our government can buy 120 more units of health care right 120 more units of health care, 180 minus 60, but they'd have to give up 100 units of military protection. So the change in military, military protection would be minus 100. Okay, so if I take the change in, if I take the change in health care and I divide it by the change in military, what that means is I divide 120 by 100, I get 1.2, right? And 1.2 divided by 1 is still 1.2. So what does that mean? Well, it means that on average, as I move from point A to point B, and each time I give up one unit of military protection, the government has to give the government can give us 1.2 more units of health care. Now, the interesting thing is that. The Republicans balked and did not want to give up all of that military. They didn't want to give up any of the military. So what the, Democrat, the Republicans do is they make the Democrats look like we, that they're weak militarily, right? And Democrats don't want to look weak militarily. So the Democrats and the Republicans compromise. They compromise out here at point C. Right, so this explains why we typically always have budget deficits. Republicans aren't willing to give up the military spending. The Democrats aren't willing to give up and, and cave on the social programs. So the, the the result is a compromise with a budget deficit, and Americans go along with that because. Uh, they feel like they're getting a free ride, right? The current generation of taxpayers is getting a free ride in a way, right? We're getting more health care without having to give up the military, right? Well, the problem is it's not a free ride because how does the government finance a budget deficit? It taxes future generations. How does it tax future generations? Well, in order to cover this budget deficit, the government has to auction off, sell a bunch of government bonds. And who's going to pay those government bonds off in 20 to 10 years from now? The next generation of workers. So the, the current generation of workers are the reason why, in my opinion, argument runs budget deficits. Because we want the free ride and we don't want to pay for it. We're going to let our sons and daughters pay this off. And guess what's going to happen in 20 to 30 years? Our sons and daughters are going to make the same decisions. And eventually, the system's going to collapse, eventually. Which is why maybe we need a balanced budget amendment. What happens if health care gets more expensive, right? Well, if the price of health care goes up, and, we, and I showed previously in that demand and supply model that with the mandate that insurance companies have to cover pre-existing conditions, the supply of health insurance falls. At the same time, the government mandates that we all get health insurance policies. That forces the demand up. With a fall in supply and an increase in demand, the price of health care rises, right? So, suppose all that plays out and the price of health care goes up. How does that affect the budget 
of the government. Well, going back to our scenario, if very liberal republic or politicians get their way and they can spend, they can get the government to spend zero money on military military protection at the new higher price. How many how many services how many services can the government offer us or give us? They can only give us 120. So it goes from 240 to where it was 220, right? Now, because the price of military, we're assuming here, remains constant, because remember in economics we change one thing at a time, the number of military units that the government can give us doesn't change, right? So the budget line for the government rotates in along the healthcare axis, making the deficit even even more worse, making it even wider, which means we're passing more debt off onto future generations, which means we're going to have to tax future generations even more. Okay, now let's let's apply the production possibility frontier to a model for free trade, and this free trade model is going to demonstrate that there are numerous benefits to free trade. Now, some concepts we need to know before we get into the free trade model. We need to understand what absolute advantage is. Absolute advantage is the situation in which one country is more productive than another country in the production of both goods. Comparative advantage is the ability of a country to produce a good or a service at a lower opportunity cost than some other country. So in our example here, let C denote the packs of cigarettes produced. Let T denote the units of textiles produced, like t-shirts. Textiles are just like t-shirts. Indonesia devotes all of its resources according to this line. Let's just assume, right? Let's assume that North Carolina devotes all of its resources according to this line, right? Where T is the quantity of textiles and C is the packs of cigarettes produced by both economies. Okay? So for Indonesia, if Indonesia devotes all of its resources to production of textiles, it will produce zero units of cigarettes, right? So we plug the zero into Indonesia's production possibility frontier, and we get 1,200, right? So if Indonesia decides it's going to devote all of its resources to production of textiles, it will produce 1,200 textiles and zero cigarettes. If it decides to devote all of its resources to production of cigarettes and it won't produce any textiles so if I plug zero into here right and I solve for C or I ask the question how many cigarettes do I need or how many cigarettes does Indonesia produce to get T to zero well 300 times 4 is 1200 1200 minus 1200 is zero so in this last part of this table Indonesia is devoting all of its resources to the production of cigarettes. Okay, so graphically, this point right here represents Indonesia making the decision to produce only textiles by focusing all of its resources on the production of textiles. This point right down here means that Indonesia is devoting all of its resources to the production of cigarettes. So it produces no textiles. We do the same thing for North Carolina. And we get this line. Now, which country has the absolute advantage in textile production? If Indonesia devotes all of its resources to producing textiles, it can manufacture 1,200 units of textiles. If North Carolina devotes all of its resources to producing textiles, it can manufacture 1,000 units of textiles. Hence, Indonesia has the absolute advantage in textiles. If Indonesia devotes all of its resources to producing cigarettes, it can manuf manufacture 300 units of cigarettes. If North Carolina devotes all of its resources to producing cigarettes, it can manufacture 500 units of cigarettes. Hence, North Carolina has the absolute advantage in producing cigarettes. Note, neither country has an ad absolute advantage in trade. In order to have an absolute advantage in trade, the intercepts of a country's production possibility frontier must be larger than the intercepts of the other country's intercepts. 
Now, which country has the comparative advantage in cigarette production? To answer this question, we have to look at the slope of the production possibility frontier. This slope says if Indonesia wants to produce one more pack of cigarettes, it gives up four units of textiles. North Carolina slope says what? It says if North Carolina wants to produce one more pack of cigarettes, it gives up two units of textiles. So, cigarette production is cheaper in North Carolina because they're giving up less. Therefore, North Carolina has the comparative advantage in the, produ the production of cigarettes. Now, suppose North Carolina and Indonesia are the only producers of cigarettes and textiles in the world. Trade barriers exist, and both countries devote half their resources to producing both goods. Indonesia will produce 150 packs of cigarettes and 600 units of textiles. North Carolina will produce 250 packs of cigarettes and 500 units of textiles. Total world production is only 400 packs of cigarettes and 1,100 units of textiles for a total production of 1,500 units. Suppose North Carolina and Indonesia pass a free trade agreement. What will North Carolina produce? What will Indonesia produce? Why is free trade good and why is free trade bad? Well, remember, Indonesia had the comparative advantage in textiles. So Indonesia will produce only textiles. North Carolina had the comparative advantage in the production of cigarettes. So North Carolina will only produce cigarettes, and it will produce 500 of them. Therefore, total world production increases from 1,500 to 1,700. 1,200 plus 500 is 1700 so world production goes from 1500 to 1700 now you know the po thing that politicians focus on when they talk about free trade agreements is this idea that before the free trade agreement Indonesia was doing what it had both industries right and it produced 600 units of textiles and 150 units of cigarettes. North Carolina, on the other hand, had both industries before the free trade agreement was assigned. It was producing 250 units of cigarettes and 500 units of textiles. Now, when they, when they signed this free trade agreement, the textile jobs in North Carolina are outsourced to Indonesia. The Cigarette jobs in Indonesia are outsourced to North Carolina. So both countries, both societies, both economies lose an industry. But the cool thing is the workers that were working in the cigarette industry in Indonesia, because the textile industry grew, they can find work in the textile industry. Uh, some of things going on in North Carolina. North Carolinians that were working in the textile plants lost their jobs, but because the cigarette industry is larger, they can go work in the cigarette industry. Now, the cool thing about free trade is both countries are wealthier. Both have, well, North Carolina has more than enough cigarettes, right? Indonesia has more than enough textiles to satisfy their populations. They're really good at doing textiles, and North Carolina's very good at doing cigarettes. So what do they do? Well, North Carolina takes some of its extra cigarettes, trades them to Indonesia for textiles. Well, it still, ha still has a lot of cigarettes left over. So it trades cigarettes to Germany for BMWs. It trades cigarettes with Florida for oranges. It trades some of its cigarettes to Idaho for potatoes. And in Indonesia's doing the same kind of thing. So free trade is kind of bad in the short run because North Carolina loses an industry, but it, its other industry grows. Indonesia in the short run loses an industry, but the other industry grows. So whatever jobs are outsourced, there are jobs being insourced at the same time.